Hey everybody, it's Peter and I'm super excited to do a comparison review and that's what this is going to be, an in-depth comparison review between the Ninja 400 and the Ninja ZX4RR because we've done a couple videos on both of these bikes before and especially with the ZX4RR, some people are saying, hey, it's a budget bike, some people are saying, hey, it's not a super sport bike and what we're going to do is leave the definitions to you, the viewer, and I'm going to go through piece by piece point by point to show you the differences between these two bikes. Now I will say that I'm going to refer to the ZX4RR as a super sport bike simply because Kawasaki classifies that cl classifies it as that on their website. This is more of a street sport bike and we'll talk about some of the differences and we can talk about each one as a beginner bike or as an experienced rider bike, all those kinds of things. So first of all, I want to thank Jim Gilbert's Wheels and Deals here in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Jim Gilbert's Power Sports. They are the number one volume Kawasaki dealer in the country and they allow me complete access to their entire vehicle lineup. So if you have questions about this vehicle, that vehicle or anything else in the lineup, make sure you subscribe and let me know in the comment section below what you have to say, what you think and the questions that you may have because I can make future videos based on your comments and we'll continue to build a video database of information. So let's get going with this comparison review. So let's just start with the really basic stuff, the stuff that probably all of us know, but in case we don't, we'll just start with that. This is a four cylinder motorcycle displacing 399 cc's. This is a two cylinder motorcycle to place displacing 399 cc. So they are both 400 cc bikes, but they are very different. And some people think this isn't going to be very quick. It absolutely is. It's quicker than the Ninja 650, for instance. And it really is a super sport bike when you talk about the, this layout of it. It's a four cylinder, inline four cylinder, the same as all the race bikes would be in the 600 and uh, 1000 class. And it really is a more sporty design. And we're, we're, what we're gonna do is start showing you some of those components from suspension to engine, but we're also gonna talk about seating position and everyday riding, because let's face it, if you're buying either of these bikes, you're probably spending most of your time on a street and not a racetrack, and the street performance of both of these bikes matters. So let's zoom in a little closer. We're gonna start with the front brakes. Actually, let's start with the Ninja 400, show you that bike in detail, and then we'll show you the upgrades and differences on the ZX4RR. So starting with the Ninja 400, we need to talk about what this is. Basically, this is an evolution of what was always an entry-level bike in the Kawasaki lineup. It started as the Ninja 250. That was legendary, ran for like 20 years in North America, pretty much. Then it went to the Ninja 300 for a while, and then they changed the Ninja 300 to the Ninja 400. Now, the Ninja 400 from the 300 was a big upgrade. The 400 lightened the weight and gave it more power. And since it's been made into this Ninja 400, it's pretty well respected as among the very best beginner bikes out there, but it's also respected among experienced riders as a tool to take to the racetrack. So its sporting capability is absolutely here. Now, those who take it to the racetrack on a regular basis often upgrade suspension and other pieces that wouldn't make a whole lot of difference on the road, but do make a difference on, this, on the uh, racetrack. So let's just start with showing you the seating position on this. This is a fairly compact bike. They're actually, I think, about the exact same length in millimeters, but you can see you still have a sporty position here. The handlebars curl back compared to the Z400. Um, they curl back a little bit more like a Ninja would. You have a slight lean forward, but you're very comfortable, very upright. And that goes to sort of the street capability of this bike. While you are upright, you can get in a tuck position that works well with the windshield. Your mirrors are still out in front of you. And it's very comfortable and compact. The one thing you will find is it's narrow and it can be narrow because it only has two cylinders underneath this tank as opposed to spreading four across. It just has the two across. So it's an inline two cylinder engine that's very comfortable but still very sporty. So now let's take a look at the front. We'll go through some of the components of this bike and then go back to back with the ZX4RR. So as we take a look at the front brake here on the Ninja 400, what we're gonna do in the very next shot is go to the ZX4RR and compare this to that, and then we'll move to the body position as well. And we'll continue to go back and forth between the two bikes. But this is really, on just about any motorcycle, how you can tell about what it was made for. You have to kind of get this right. There's a lot of forces on the front wheel, uh, whether you're on the street or on the track, and everything in here kind of matters. So let's just take a close look at what we have. First of all, you have some styling in here. A lot of time the fairing covers 
an upside down fork because you don't want your stanchions to get bugs and dirt and that kind of thing and have the fork seals uh, kind of be ruined. So when you stand above this bike and look down, this fairing appears like it might be covering upside down forks. If you don't know what I'm talking about with upside down forks, you'll see that in just a second. But this isn't that. This is a little bit less expensive and more traditional front fork. Now it works very well, but it doesn't really have any adjustability or anything like that and that can really matter, especially on a racetrack and in a true sporting bike. So you've got some styling here that looks like it covers up something, but it doesn't, and then it's just the standard fork. Take a look at this nut here. You're gonna see a difference in that nut there. Take a look at the brake rotor. Now this is a larger rotor than is on the ZX4RR. It's actually one of the largest rotors on any of the sport bikes in the Kawasaki lineup. However, it's just a single rotor. So there's a few things going on here. There's the pedal style rotor, which they've used on a lot of the sportier bikes for a while. In theory, this gives you a little bit extra um, a little cooling. I think it's also for style, so that pedal style. Now on a radial mount, which you'll see on the other bike, I've never seen this pedal style on a radial mount brake, so we'll talk about the brakes in a second. Take a look at these brakes. If you don't know anything about brakes, just memorize what they kind of look like. You can see there's just two small areas. There's two pistons squeezing onto a single caliper here, so single caliper is the single disc. You do have ABS brakes, and you have a 17-inch front wheel, which is traditional for sport bikes, but most sport bikes use a 120 width front wheel. This one only has a 110 width, so it's a little bit narrower. Now, a narrower tire can allow you to have a little bit more playfulness with the bike. The other bike has narrow tires for a super sport bike, but they are wider than this. So there's lots of playfulness in both these bikes. But again, overall brake disc, we'll show you the difference there. The nut in here, the suspension in here, the disc in there, and the overall tire size is a little different. Let's jump right over to the ZX4RR and start comparing there. All right, so as we fade into the ZX4RR wheel, hopefully you can right away see some differences. Again, the styling of this fairing here is going to cover the front area here. So what this does is keep bugs and other dirt from piling up there, which will help your fork seal. And this is an upside down fork. Now, there's lots of theories about why upside down forks are used. There's a couple benefits in particular. First of all, it's stiffer up top, stiffer on a uh, suspension component is better, on steering component is better. And it also allows for less unsprung weight. Now, less unsprung weight is important because you actually have extra brake weight here. So you have uh, thick rotors here, so there's you, no pedal style here, and that's because of the radial mount. You can see the other ones were kind of like about this big. They had two small pistons. You have much bigger radial mount here, so there's four piston calipers here, and you've got the dual discs as well as the ABS here. So there is some more weight on here, but again, stopping power is exceptional here. This is, again is better for stiffness, better for upgrades. This is true super sport type stuff along with the upside down forks. And then again, still have a 17 inch rim, has a little 400 sticker here. Uh, the stickers on the green are on both, but this one says 400. That's one way to identify just from the wheels what this is. And then you have a centimeter wider tire here, which can give you just a little bit more of a standard front tire size than the 400 uh, twin cylinders. So a lot of differences right here on the front that really speak to extra performance. So now let's approach the ZX4RR and talk about seating position on here, and that will lead us into a frame discussion, which I think is important. First of all, you are a little bit more leaned over here than on the 400. So this is the ZX4RR. It also feels a little bit wider through here, but they hide it well with the tank. You can see some bodywork coming around here and some width in here. Now the bodywork actually serves a purpose. They have a ram air system in the front that directs air around there and into the system. On something like the uh, higher end sport bikes you can have that rammer go right into the frame that works with the uh, bike and that's where some of the controversy starts so first of all let's just cover the seating position although I am more leaned over here this is the most upright super sport in the Kawasaki lineup that puts me in a position that is more comfortable for the road so Let's talk about the ram air through the plastic bodywork as opposed to th as opposed to through the frame. Some people are saying this isn't a true super sport because of the frame style. Now, I can see when you look on a website and see a steel trellis frame, it doesn't appear to be a super sport compared to like an aluminum fancy whatever type frame. And this is about 412 pounds. That one's about 366 pounds. That one being the Ninja 400. So there is some weight here. Some of that weight goes to things like the brakes. You just saw a lot more components in there. Uh, a better suspension sometimes can weigh more. It can perform better, but it can weigh more. You have an extra uh, liter of fuel space in here. You have a four cylinder engine in here. 
This is still a sport bike with all of the components there, but they still have to hit a price point. They can't price this so high with all high-end components that it's gonna be higher than the ZX-6R, for instance. So in Canada, I think they did a good job of pricing this right. Down here, you can see the windshield is a little bit lower. That allows me to get into a really, really low tuck, including my chest right here on the fuel tank, which means you can get in that true racing position. But the overall triangle here is very comfortable. There's actually a little bit, tiny bit more foot room here on the ZX4RR than on the Ninja 400. So frame style, I will give you people who say this is a budget sport bike in the sense that it is a more budget friendly super sport bike. But let's continue to take a look at some of the differences here. And we're gonna start up here on the top side on both bikes so we can look at suspension, dash and controls. So I'm gonna start with this outside view, kind of zoomed out view of the Ninja 400, just to show you a couple things before we zoom in and show you the dash and everything else. So first of all, take a look at the top of the suspension here. No adjustments, nothing there. You can see that it's a little bit more budget oriented. And again, they're good forks for the class, but they're not super sport forks here. You do have some weight savings in here, some true, true sort of super sport uh, clip-ons here. They are rise up, not uh, lower down. And then you've got the traditional dash there, which has a lot of function. We're gonna look at that in just a second here, but you also have a little spot here. Now there's nothing there right now, but that can be for a 12 volt port as an accessory, which of course can power your phone, which you know you may wanna put up front. So again, a little bit more street oriented up here. We're gonna take a look at some controls. Actually, let's just zoom down for a second here at the controls. Uh, one thing to point out as well, you don't have any adjustable brake or clutch levers here. We'll look at the controls in a second. Let's jump over to the ZX4RR and take the same basic view to see some differences. So the ZX4RR, right away you see these gold color fork tubes here. This is the Showa SFFBP. What does that stand for? I really don't remember right now. These are better shocks. There's adjustability over here for the preload. And again, on the um, ZX4RR, because in Canada we have the ZX4RR that you see and the ZX4R, which I've done in other videos. The ZX4R would not have the adjustable uh, preload up there. You do have it on this one. So again, adjustable race spec type suspension, just what you really want to ride and have a good precision control here. And again, the nice thing with adjustable suspension is whether you ride on the racetrack or not, it's nice to be able to tinker with things and dial things in, and that's what you can do here. Now, in addition, no 12 volt port down here. That's because this is sort of a conduit for your Ram air. So the air comes in through the very front of the uh, bike, and it comes around the bodywork and into the engine. Again, that Ram air type system there. Uh, and then the TFT display, which is an advanced TFT display, has a few extra functions that you don't get in the typical like a Ninja 650 or something like that. And then coming down to the controls, again, we'll take a look, better look at them here, but you do see here on the clutch lever, you do have the adjustable clutch lever and adjustable um, brake lever on the opposite side. So we're gonna take a look at the controls in a second, but let's start with the dash. All right, so back to the Ninja 400, let's turn the key on and you can see the more basic dash here. Again, this is an entry level bike in Kawasaki's lineup. And again, it's a leading edge bike for its price point, but it is an entry level bike. So you don't have the TFT display, but you do have quite a few functions here that you may not expect. So first of all, on top, you've got the odometer up there. You can see it's now trip A and trip B. We can click back to odometer. Then on the bottom here, over here, you have currently a setup for kilometers per liter. That's the uh, fuel efficiency. And it can be set to miles per gallon, liters per hundred kilometers, all sorts of different things. That is the instant. There's the average. Again, this bike hasn't really gone anywhere. Range is about 40 kilometers, which is not a whole lot and back to the instant fuel efficiency. You also have a gear indicator that's right up front and center, so it's in neutral right now. This is a six speed bike. The clock is always visible and you have a tachometer, all evenly spaced out to uh, about 12,000 RPM for a red line. And again, this bike can really use all of that. It's not something that has to be you know, fully, fully revved out. It does make a little bit of power down low and uh, it'll continue to make decent power up high. Over on the ZX4RR, you do have this TFT display, which is pretty familiar to all of us uh, here in the Kawasaki lineup. This is pretty much the standard display on anything at this price point on up. Now there are a whole bunch of features in here. We've shown some of those in other videos, so I'm not gonna flip through them all, but let's just talk about some highlights. First of all, you have all the information you need. You have a tachometer that revs up to 16,000 RPM. Really quick, quick disclaimer with this bike, it does stop making power at around 11,500 in Canada. Uh, there is a noise regulation issue here. So, um, you know, I'm speaking for myself, not for Kawasaki, but I assume if you want to fix that, you can uh, certainly flash things yourself and move the noise regulation issue from Kawasaki onto yourself and uh, get that computer upgraded. This is a very common thing to do when you switch a muffler on a sport bike. So again, something to remember that way. We'll talk about that in another video. Most of you already know that. Now, you have a gear indicator there, right front and center. I didn't point out the fuel gauge and temperature gauge on the other one. They were a little bit hard to see. They were on the other side.
side of the speedometer there, but they're sort of shaped the same here. They function the same way. And then you have um, the rain mode right now is what it's in. So there's rain, there's uh, road, there's sport, and there's rider. So rider being a custom mode there. You also have a low power and a high power mode here. You have traction control in here. Uh, like I said, they have lap timers and that kind of thing in there with a sort of a race mode type dash. And then of course, a lot of the same stuff here. If you look through the odometer, it goes trip A there and then trip B right there and back to odometer. And then if I hit the other button here, you can see battery there is at 12.1 volts. You've got fuel efficiency in instant and average right there. And then your range and then your average speed, which is an extra thing, total time. And back to the battery, we're just gonna leave it there on the instant fuel efficiency. So a lot of options there. This can be inverted white and black. So everything that's black would be white, white would be black. Like I said, it has other displays in there, lots of settings. You can connect your cell phone to that. So you can get email notifications, call notifications, uh, those types of things. A lot of benefits to this um, overall display. It is an upgraded display over the 400. Stay with the ZX4RR, let's just take a quick look at the controls. The one thing you can't see is right here by my finger, there's a little trigger that will flash your high beams. That's typical stuff on Kawasaki sport bikes. High beam, low beam right there, signal lights, horn, uh, uh, four-way flashers or hazard lights, whatever you wanna call them. And you can see in here, this is a lap timer right there as well as your control for your display. So you can move the center display, there's buttons on the display, on the bottom of the display, or you can move them while you're riding right here. In the background there, there's your adjuster for your clutch lever, so you can pull that clutch lever out, spin that around. Both of these bikes have slipper and assist clutch it, clutches, so that again makes it easier, lighter to pull, as well as making it more of a performance-oriented uh, thing, so you can really bang through the downshifts and uh, find, um, you know, if, you, if you've done it wrong, you can dump that clutch, instead of having the wheel uh, slip or you know, slide or skid, the clutch can slip as well. So slipper and assist clutches are really nice. This one though, let's talk about the clutch on the ZX4R because it has a feature that you don't have to use the clutch all the time. Let's quickly talk about that. Taking a look at the shifter here on the ZX4RR, this comes standard with a quick shifter. So what this is gonna do is you use your clutch to get into first gear. And then from that point on, if the quick shifter is turned on, you can switch up and down without the clutch. And the way this works is it sends a quick signal to um, stop the engine essentially from firing really quickly and it allows you to do an instant shift without releasing the throttle on an upshift and then pushing on throttle and downshift, uh, but you know, instant, instant shifts. That's going to make this quicker. That's gonna make it faster on a racetrack. It's very, very quick. It's very awesome. And it's available on the ZX4RR standard it's an option on the ZX4R. So it is an option to put on the model without that. If that's the one reason that you're moving to this model and you don't need the extra suspension bits, um, then this is a pretty cool piece on the ZX4RR. Let's just quickly show you the suspension while we're here on the back, and then we'll do the same type of thing with the controls and uh, suspension on the Ninja 400. All right, so we're looking at the horizontal backlink rear suspension. So that's general design is used in a lot of mid to upper level uh, sport bikes in the Kawasaki lineup. But this one has a little extra adjustment here. This is very much ZX-10RR type stuff. So again, part of the fun of owning a super sport bike is being able to dial it in, whether you do it for the track to gain that split second over everybody else, or whether you just do it for fun to be able to play with stuff. You've got fully adjustable suspension in the front. You've got fully adjustable suspension in the back here. So you can see that in your preload and your uh, uh, rebound and compression right there. So a lot of adjustability here on a system that has moved uh, sort of tipped forward and going forward. Now let's look at the difference here at the suspension of the Ninja 400 and then we'll go back to the controls of the Ninja 400. So this is an example of the Ninja 400 being a little bit more of a budget bike but it doesn't matter as much because the engine is so small that you don't have to have a forward, you know, bring the suspension forward in that horizontal backlink configuration to keep the suspension forward and low. But you can see it's an up and down type suspension. You do have, if we zoom right in here, the preload adjuster right there, so you can spin that, but that's all the adjustment you have on the rear suspension. So it is just not nearly as high end suspension on the Ninja 400 as on the ZX4RR. And that's a really big piece. Suspension is a huge piece of enjoying a true super sport bike. And again, perfectly fine for what this is, but not a high-end piece like on the ZX4RR. Take a look at the left side controls in the Ninja 400. You can see the clutch lever, very easy to pull. Like we talked about that slipper and assist clutch on here as well. And then again, traditional controls here. You still have the trigger here for your high beams, LED headlights and taillights on this, but not LED signals. LED signals on the ZX4RR. Uh, regular high beam, low beam, 
signal lights, horn, and there's no hazard light or no four-way flasher, and there's no uh, extra controls here to control that display. So that display on the TFT can be, on the ZX4R can be just controlled here. This one has to be controlled over on the dash itself. So you're not going to be making instant changes by keeping your uh, hand on the handlebars in this bike. And again, no adjustable clutch lever here the same way as um, no adjustable brake lever on the other side. We'll just quickly throw, show you the throttle side here on the uh, Ninja 400. It is a traditional kill switch and start switch there. Let's just quickly take a look at the difference on the ZX4RR. Throttle side here on ZX4RR, you have a kill switch and start switch combined into one and the select button here. The select button here can be used with your TFT display. So you can really control that display without taking your hands off the handlebars. And that's a good thing to have, especially as you're making quick decisions uh, across the track or something like that. Uh, just a little bit more high-end component again. All right, so let's have an honest discussion about what these bikes are and who they're for. First of all, this is essentially a budget bike. For Kawasaki's lineup, it is lower level components than some. However, it is a very much a class leading bike. And if you do your research on the Ninja 400, you'll find that as a beginner bike, as an entry level bike, as a smaller displacement two cylinder bike, it is very, very much class leading. Every bike is built to a price point. If it wasn't, you would have all of the H2s flying around and with all top end components and you can have bikes in the Kawasaki lineup up to $60,000. This one is still built to a price. However, they've put on some really important parts here. So some of you have complained that because you read on the spec sheet that it's got a steel frame, that maybe it's just like a budget bike, it's not a true super sport. But I think that's a piece of, if they give it a steel frame like this, Yes, it might be a hair heavier than it could have been, but that saves money in the budget to hit the price point you want to hit with great suspension, a great engine, and great brakes. And when you talk about what makes up a great super sport bike, that's the key pieces. Good engine, good suspension, good brakes, and that's what this one has. Is it a top of the line super sport bike? It is not, but it does allow you to have super sport power on the street. It's a more approachable sport bike on the track. And when, that's when it comes down to comparing both of these bikes. Both of these bikes can be taken to the track. And to be fair, most riders on the road do not have enough skill to have more skill than what can be done on a Ninja 400. If you took a really pro rider on a Ninja 400, they would smoke much bigger bikes. The difference is you have a little bit more of a super sport experience here. Having a little bit better brakes, you can really dive into a corner a little bit later. Uh, having the better suspension, you can start dialing in the suspension both to the roads you ride and the type of sport riding that you do. And that gives you that more of that same experience. And the four cylinder engine, it's always making power. You always have at least one cylinder firing uh, to make power, whereas a two cylinder, there is some pause in the power band. That's just the way two cylinders work versus four cylinders. So you have a full super sport feel here, full super sport experience and in a lot of ways full super sport technology with the TFT display, with those extra displays, the rider modes, the high and low power, with the Ram Air system, you really have a bike that gives you that entire experience right here at a pretty affordable price point for what it is, especially here in Canada. I know in certain markets, it's, this bike seems to be priced a little higher compared to certain bikes than it is here in Canada. So we have that advantage here. We also have the ZX4R, which is less expensive than this, still has good suspension, but not as good suspension, but the same brakes, the option for the uh, quick shifter, because all those pieces well, quick shifter gives you that sort of super sport performance. So again, we can debate about where these bikes lie. If you are a beginner, some people will say this bike is fine for a beginner. I can see that argument being made because there's not a ton of torque in this bike and with reduced power from the factory, maybe you can make that argument. I don't think this is so much a beginner bike. I think an experienced rider is gonna get the most out of this bike. This bike is the bike I recommend by far the most to beginners. This is a bike that you can enjoy as a beginner, but you won't get tired of it as you move on through your motorcycling time. And if you wanna to move to something that with a little bit more technology, that kind of thing, that's where these super sport bikes come in. I will give Kawasaki credit that they didn't make this so full on race bike that it's uncomfortable for the street. This is very much a streetable super sport. And I think they deserve credit for that. And then you can tell me what you think about these bikes. Again, sometimes people who have not seen these bikes have not looked at them. They've only read a spec sheet. They've made a lot of opinions. So in the comment section of the ZX4RR in my own YouTube page, I've seen a lot of people, like I said, who have never seen the bike, who have strong opinions. But this bike is a bike where a lot of you do have opinions because you own it. And I think when you talk to owners of this bike and owners of this bike, you'll find that there's a difference to these bikes for sure. 
and one may be better for you than the other. So hopefully this helps you explain, helps to explain the differences between the two. But if you want to know more, let me know in the comment section and make sure you subscribe because I can come back to these bikes again and again. I want to thank Jim Gilbert's Wheels and Deals, Jim Gilbert's Power Sports. Right now, this is the very last four ZX4RR that we expect to see here at Canada's number one volume Kawasaki dealer for this year. So this one is still available at the time of filming, and I'm gonna put it up today. So what is it, the 9th or 10th or so of uh, May, it will be available today. Uh, lots of uh, Ninja 400s around as well. And if you wanna see a massive showroom with all these in stock, swing on down to Jim Gilbert's Wheels and Deals, Jim Gilbert's Power Sports, and you can check them out for yourself. Thanks everybody for watching.